Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to discuss vaginal bleeding during pregnancy. We are going to discuss the differential diagnosis of vaginal bleed in a pregnant patient. Then we are going to talk about the history taking. What are the important points that you should not miss during data gathering? How to do the examination? What investigations to order? And how to proceed with the assessment and management of such patients? So first of all, let's take a look at the differential diagnosis here. Uh, we can broadly divide the differentials in the first half of pregnancy and second half of the pregnancy that is less than 20 weeks and more than 20 weeks. Now, uh, some of the differentials um, can cause vision bleeding at any point in pregnancy. And the three most important to remember are genital urinary infections, bleeding disorders, and trauma. Okay, As you can see, I have, dis I have written uh, GU infections and bleeding disorders. Uh, in both categories, but I forgot to write trauma here. But please bear in mind that there are three uh, common causes that can cause vaginal bleed at any point in pregnancy. And those include bleeding disorders, genital urinary infection, and trauma. Okay. Now, let's take a look at less than 20 weeks, that is the first half of pregnancy. Now, there are three most important conditions that can cause vaginal bleeding in the first half of pregnancy. Uh, the first one is ectopic pregnancy, second one is molar pregnancy, and the third one is miscarriage. Now, all, all these three conditions are quite serious. Ectopic pregnancy can easily turn into a life-threatening situation if it ruptures. Uh, molar pregnancy, again, it's quite a serious condition. And miscarriage, not only is emotionally traumatizing, but if it's incomplete miscarriage, it can even be life-threatening um, for the mother. So all these three conditions are basically red flags that you cannot miss, okay? Um, now, more than 20 weeks, that is the second half of the pregnancy. So in the second half of the pregnancy, placenta is well-formed. So the first condition here is placenta-related, uh, that is placenta previa, okay? Placenta previa, as you all know, is basically low-lying placenta, where the placenta is attached to the lower segment of the uterus. And as the um, pregnancy continues and the uterus grows, uh, the lower segment of the uterus also um, increases in size and can be, uh, it can lead to a stretch on the placenta and can then cause the bleeding from the placenta, uh, which is known as placenta previa. Then placental abruption. Placental abruption is when basically the placenta is in its normal place, but because of either trauma or because of very high blood pressure, placenta separates from the uterus and there is bleeding between the placenta and the uterus, and this is known as placental abruption. Okay, placental abruption is quite painful, whereas placenta previa is uh, placenta previa is completely painless condition. Then bloody show is basically a little bit of bleeding which happens at the start of the labor. So in case of a premature labor, there will be a little bit of uh, bleeding, which is bloody show, and then um, this will be followed by a gush of a large amount of fluid, which is basically um, uh, which is basically what, what is called as breaking of water. Um, so gush of large amount of amniotic fluid and followed by a regular uterine contraction. So again, we have three uh, conditions in the second half of the pregnancy as well. Uh, placenta previa, placental abruption, and blood tissue. Other than that, uh, cervical cancer or any gynecological cancer can also cause bleeding during pregnancy, but of course that will be much more rare. Okay, now data gathering, uh, history taking, as we all know, the first part here is uh, history of presenting illness. We are going to start with our introduction. We are going to introduce ourselves by our full name and role. Um, everyone have a different style of introduction, so please do it in your own way. And then uh, we are going to uh, basically uh, get from the patient details and again use two identifiers. The first one is the patient full name and the second one is date of birth. So you're going to confirm the patient full name and the patient's date of birth. Then you will start with an open-ended question. You will ask the patient, how may I help you today? And then they will give you uh, the presenting complaint, which is virtually a bleed. Again, uh, go for an open-ended question. Um, ask the patient, can you please tell me a bit more about it? And the patient will tell, uh, the patient will tell you um, a few more details. Then you will explore uh, the bleed in detail. So as you all know, uh, for any uh, symptom other than pain, we use the mnemonic Odipara, that is onset, duration, intensity, progression, aggravating and relieving factors. But here the Odipara mnemonic will not fit well. So we will kind of use its modified form. 
So first of all, we'll ask about the onset of bleed. When did the bleed start? Uh, you know, the exact time and how did it start? Uh, was there anything triggering it? Um, any trauma, for example? And then we'll ask about the amount of bleeding, the color of the bleed. Is it, you know, like fresh blood, dark red, or is it uh, kind of brownish or old blood? Then we'll ask about the content of the bleed. Is it only, you know, um, is it only blood or are there any clots in it? Um, a very important question is to establish whether the bleeding has stopped or is it ongoing. For example, the patient is presenting to you in the evening and she says, um, I had vision bleed in the morning and it started at, for example, 9 a.m. in the morning. It is very, very important to establish um, if the bleeding has stopped since you know, 9 a.m. or what, were there more than one episode? Is it, is it still ongoing? Okay, it's, it's very important, but very easy to forget. So please you know, keep in mind that you have to establish uh, whether there is any ongoing bleed or not, okay? Then you will ask about last menstrual period or gestational week. So basically we ask the last menstrual period to establish the gestational week, but you can just ask the patient if they know uh, how far along they are in the pregnancy. Um, so basically give an idea whether the patient is in the first half or in the second half because your differential diagnosis vary depending upon the patient's gestational age. Okay, uh, you should also establish well, if there were any previous episode of spotting before this one. Um, also inquire in detail about the last antenatal visit, uh, what happened in the last antenatal visit, were there any complications noted? Um, did they do an ultrasound scan? What was the result of the ultrasound scan? Any blood test that might be requested? And what were the results of the blood tests? Okay. So ask about uh, details of the last antenatal visit. Then we'll ask about associated symptoms and will also help us in ruling out uh, some of the differentials. So we'll ask about any pain. Okay. Because... Um, for the condition like placenta previa, there is completely painless pain. Okay, but in conditions like ectopic pregnancy and and placental abruption, uh, there will be a lot of pain. Even molar pregnancy will cause uh, pain and kind of pelvic heaviness and discomfort. Um, premature labor, uh, it will present with pain and regular contraction. So basically the pain in premature labor is because of the contractions. And um, miscarriage can be painful or it can be painless. Um, so it kind of depends. Uh, basically missed miscarriage will be painless and the other sorts of miscarriages will be painful. Uh, anyhow, we will ask about pain, which will help you in uh, kind of think about certain differential diagnosis. Um, so if there is pain, then we are going to uh, ask about the details of the pain. We are going to explore the pain by asking about Socrates, which basically means site of the pain, onset, character of the pain, um, radiations, aggravating factors, relieving factors, etc. So basically in radiation, you should remember that in, that in ectopic pregnancy, the pain radiates towards the tip of the shoulder. Okay. Then we um, should also ask about hypovolumic symptoms. These are, excuse me, these are really important to ask because if there is heart racing or dizziness, then it means that the patient has lost a uh, large amount of blood and the patient is quite unstable hemodynamically. Then fever, asking about fever is important because um, any genetic urinary infection will present with fever and should also ask about dysuria. Um, and urinary frequency and any PV discharge. Then um, please ensure that whether there is any change in the fetal movements, uh, are the fetal movements present, are they completely absent, are they reduced in frequency because it will indicate uh, fetal distress or fetal demise. Even. Okay, any water gush because if there is a gush of water, then it might indicate that the membranes have ruptured. Um, Ask about the presence of grape like material and pelvic heaviness. This will indicate towards molar pregnancy. In molar pregnancy, uh, the bleeding will contain um, grape like material and there will be pelvic heaviness. The patient will tell you that they'll be experiencing pelvic uh, heaviness for quite some time. Then ask about headache and swelling of the hands and the feet. This is important because 
as uh, previous as previously discussed placental abruption is a common cause of pb bleed in patients in the latter half of the pregnancy and um, the major causes of placental abruption are number one trauma and number two um, hypertension so pregnancy induced hypertension or preeclampsia that's why you should ask about the swelling of the hands and feet and headache okay um, bleeding elsewhere so if there is bleeding going on um, in the parts of the body if there is bruising then it will indicate a bleeding disorder okay so that was about your history of uh, presenting illness then we are going to ask about past history. So past history will again contain three sections, past obstetric history, past gynecologic history, and past medical history. So in past obstetric history, you should ask about previous pregnancies and the outcome of previous pregnancies. Were there any complications at all? And um, previous miscarriages and abortions. Um, okay, then past gynecological history, you should establish uh, the date of last pap smear and the result of the last pap smear because um, cervical cancer can also cause bleeding during pregnancy. Ask about uh, the history of STIs um, and any diseases of the womb like fibroids uh, or disease of the neck of the womb, for example, polyps. So fibroids, if they are present, um, obviously it's rare, but sometimes fibroids, if they are already present, they can cause, uh, they can degenerate during pregnancy. Um, it's just called red degeneration of fibroid and can give rise to bleeding in pregnancy. So it's not much of a serious condition, but you should keep an eye on it. Then if there are um, polyps, cervical polyps, then, they, uh, then uh, cervical polyps can also cause bleeding during pregnancy. So you should just ask if there are any diseases, any diagnosed disease of the womb or neck of the womb. Uh, past medical history, you should establish whether the patient has hypertension or not. Um, has the patient ever been diagnosed with a bleeding disorder? So then after past history, um, the next thing in the next portion, the history taking is mephitosa, which is basically any medications that the patient might be taking, any allergies. Family history. So family history is important in terms of family history of miscarriages or complications during pregnancies, for example, preeclampsia. So please don't forget about the family history of miscarriages or pregnancy complication and then the psychosocial history. So what do you do for a living? And an important thing in social history is to ascertain the patient's support network. So who is, who is at home with you? And um, also establish you must rule out you know uh, you must rule out abuse domestic abuse or domestic violence in a patient in a pregnant patient who is presenting with vaginal bleeding. Okay, so please uh, don't forget about um, safety at home. So just ask um, what to do for a living, who do you live with, how is everything at home, you know. Uh, for example, this patient is living with his partner, with her partner, just ask if the partial partner is supportive, uh, etc. Okay, so basically, uh, kind of weak screening questions to rule out uh, domestic abuse and to ensure the patient's safety at home. Then, uh, lifestyle questions so, uh, cafe ticks versus stains for cigarettes, that is, smoking, alcohol, food, exercise, and recreational drugs. Uh, again, the most important thing in the psychosocial and lifestyle is to ask about smoking and alcohol as the patient is pregnant. So the patient should not be smoking or taking alcohol and it is important to ask. And then safety at home. So please don't forget about these three, smoking, alcohol, safety at home, um, and family history of miscarriages and pregnancy complications. Then you are going to ask about the ideas, concerns, and expectations of the patient. Of course, the patient is pregnant and Mostly, um, if a pregnant patient presents with bleeding during pregnancy, they will be concerned about their baby, uh, their baby's well-being, and uh, whether they have lost their baby or not. So, um, you should address their concerns. Then, in the examination, uh, in the examination part, we will start with the vitals to see if the patient is hemodynamically stable. If the patient is not hemodynamically stable, then of course you will go with the A to B approach. Here we breathing circulation, etc. Um, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, then you should do GP abdominal examination to assess the fetal lie and um, auscultate for fetal heart if the fetal heart sounds are present or not. 
uh, and do a CTG. So CTG will depend upon your location. So if you are in the GP surgery, you cannot do CTG because CTG machine is not available. But if you are in the hospital, then you can do CTG. Okay. Uh, if the patient is more than 20 V, then avoid for speculum or bimanual examination. Speculum on this placenta area is ruled out because um, during the perspeculum examination or bimanual examination, the patient with placenta previa can trigger a life-threatening bleeding episode. Um, now, management will certainly depend upon uh, the diagnosis, the provisional diagnosis, and I will discuss management of each specific uh, differential in a separate video uh, because it will take you know it will take the, uh, quite some time and the video will become quite long. So I'm going to do that in a separate video, but in general. What you are going to do is to explain your provisional diagnosis to the patient, okay? Address the patient concerns. Um, take blood for full blood count, clotting profile, grouping and cross -reach. This is very important because uh, regardless of the cause of bleeding, if the patient's blood group is negative, if the patient is RH negative, then regardless of the cause of bleeding, uh, you will need to administer NTD immunoglobulin, okay? So you need to do that. Uh, full blood count to look for any signs and symptom of anemia, uh, any signs of anemia, sorry, and clotting profiling to see if there is any derangement of clotting. And uh, arrange ultrasound scan to rule out um, uh, to rule out placenta previa. Um, then, depending upon the situation, we will either admit and arrange senior review or we will refer. Uh, both depending upon the situation and depending upon where we are. If we are in a GP surgery, then we will refer. If we are in the hospital, then we will admit and arrange senior review. And um, yeah, so that was all about uh, vaginal bleeding during pregnancy. And I will see you soon in the next video in which I will discuss management of each separate differential diagnosis. Uh, most importantly, uh, miscarriages, uh, placenta previa, um, placental abruption, um, and ectopic pregnancy. So I hope this was helpful and uh, if you like my video and you haven't already subscribed to my channel, then please like, share and subscribe um, and I will see you soon in the next video.